So by show of hands, how many folks here have ever worked with an outside design firm on the development of a structural package? Hands are not going very high, but I'm gonna say, thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna say about a third of folks. Uh, I'll give you a little bit about my background uh, in laying the foundation for why we're here today. Uh, I was in the design consulting business for 10 years. Uh, 20 years ago, I had a bit of an epiphany. I'm in a meeting with one of the partners and we had just exceeded $300,000 in billable hours. You know, this, is, this is getting out of control. Should we have a conversation with the client? We seem to be looping. Are we ever gonna get to market? And we're never going to go to market. They know that we're never going to go to market. We know that. We're all getting paid, calm down. Just keep doing what you're doing, it'll be fine. Now, that's not to say that that is every design project with every design firm, certainly not with every FMCG, but if you've been in the business for any length of time, you know there is a business model where there's a clock that's running. And the longer the clock runs, the more money is made by the design firm. The brand owner, on the other hand, doesn't make any money until something is on a shelf, and not just on a shelf, but selling well. So that, to me, represented a disconnect in the interest of those two parties. Throw up my hands, I go back to business school with the plan to get out, leave this business altogether. Uh, thankfully, I, I got a phone call from a recruiter 15 years ago, uh, a company named Berlin Packaging that at the time I'd not heard of, was interested in starting a design studio. And that's what eventually led me to Studio 111 and led us to be here today. So, very quickly, to who Berlin Packaging is. So Berlin Packaging is a US-based company, $2.6 billion hybrid supplier of mostly rigid packaging. Uh, we are now approaching our 32nd year of record earnings growth, which is a, a pretty enviable record in the packaging business. As most of us know, packaging grows at about GDP. So we are, uh, we are growing at a multiple of that. What is a hybrid packaging supplier? A hybrid packaging supplier, as we define it, is not a distributor because a distributor just holds goods for other folks and then ships them out. They break bulk. That's not exactly what we do. We're not a manufacturer in that we don't have property, plant, and equipment assets, which is a good thing. We're not limited to a, a given machine profile. And we have specialty services and offerings. So I'm here representing one of the service divisions of the company named Studio 111. We are the design and innovation consulting arm of Berlin Packaging. So our clientele is a mix of not only Berlin packaging folks, but also folks that have come to us from the outside, and in some cases, even design firms that we work with. There are four practice groups within the studio. I won't read you the slide, but there's lots and lots of experience. And now the studio, by the way, isn't just the studio. Uh, back in 2016, we partnered with Bruni Packaging, or Bruni Glass, uh, based in Milan, Bruni also has a design studio, so now we have an even larger footprint with an even greater uh, breadth of expertise. These are some of the folks that we've worked with over the course of the last 15 years. Remember, 15 years ago, this didn't exist. It was, it was a business model, it was a notion. So we had no portfolio, we had no clients in the space, and in a fairly short period of time, we've developed uh, a nice base of folks that we work with. Now, everybody up on that slide knows where to buy packaging. There's, there's, AB InBev is quite aware of how to acquire glass bottles. The reason we believe they work with us is because of the model that we'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, Category-wise, we're in everything from personal care. Uh, actually found one of our innovations on the airplane on the way over, so very happy to see that. I will not uh, let you guess what the angle of that shot was taken. <laughs> Uh, lots and lots of premium and luxury goods, automotive, confections, food, gifting, pharma, OTC. Uh, Sagenti is here somewhere today. Yes. Uh, even consumables for highly technical devices and medical systems. But we're here today, of course, to talk about BWS, beer, wine, and spirits. Uh, a great deal of breadth in that category as well. So lots of custom structural development, lots of branding work, some of it uh, for, hopefully, brands you know, and if not, brands you will know soon. Dispensing systems, closures, 
We don't make clickers, but we should. There's an opportunity here for anybody who has a, an entrepreneurial. Uh, lots of gifting, and of course, uh, again, with the introduction or the uh, adoption of the uh, Bruni design expertise, lots and lots of amazingly highly technical, very difficult to execute projects as well. So enough about us. Let's, let's sort of go back to the beginning and talk about why I hope you're here. Design. Again, going back to, the, to where, we, where we left that story off, $300,000 in billable hours. We're all just sort of wink, wink, nudge, nudge. We're not, we know this isn't going to launch. That's because failure is frequent in FMCG. It's more likely than not that a launch will fail. It's more likely than not that the launch, even by any measure of success for a small launch, probably isn't going to achieve much from a financial standpoint. As we'll talk about in a second, even those that do sometimes cannibalize the products that are already on the shelf for the brand. So the net, net is, it's a very challenging thing to do to launch new products, which makes it very difficult for a lot of folks to conceive of the notion of spending the money and the time to do custom packaging development. It's a daunting exercise for a lot of folks, especially if they haven't done it very often. That is the fault of us as FMCG marketers because we have inundated folks with too many choices. They're mad at us, effectively. There was a, a study by, done by Accenture called Consumer Attitudes Toward Innovation. And what they found was that consumers are very jaded. They don't think we're doing our job. One third said, effectively, there's nothing new about the new products that are coming out today, and three fourths said, not only am I jaded, but I don't see you doing any better in the near future. Within the next five, I, I don't see anything coming down the pipe within the next two years that's going to excite me either. That was 75% of folks. So this is really of our own doing. We're not giving them anything to be excited about because they don't think we're doing anything different for them. We've also inundated them with too much messaging. We, we're, Every waking hour of every day, we're hitting, we're knocking on the front door, we're pounding on the door for their attention. And they're not giving it to us. They have almost an alert, somebody said earlier they hate to use the term millennials, but we'll use it. They have an almost allergic reaction to being marketed to. They don't like being marketed to and they won't be marketed to if they know they're being marketed to. So what we would advocate for is something other than what's happening today, which is proliferation. We just haven't segmented the market tightly enough. If we could come up with another sub-sub-segment, if we could come up with another way to say mint in toothpaste, we could, we could finally take over the category. We went to a store, we actually sent an intern to the corner, CVS in Chicago. There are 32 unique SKUs of Crest. There are 26 unique SKUs of Colgate. That's not including sizes, that's just flavors. So the two brand captains, have between them almost 60 flavors. There is no need for 60 flavors of toothpaste. It reminds me of something that a brand owner told me years ago. I, I just want a brand to be like a turtle. I want it to live forever. I want it to just be this thing that just gets bigger and bigger, and it's unassailable. After a while, we just, it just becomes part of the landscape. Well, the thing about turtles is they start as hatchlings, and to get a turtle, you need lots and lots of hatchlings. Has anybody ever watched a David Attenborough special on, this is what happens to most turtles. Sorry. <laughs> so, turtles make it to the water, even a fourth of the turtles still actually end up cannibalizing, well, they're eating the other turtles, if you will. They're cannibalizing the brands that you've set out to grow. So, this is a very depressing presentation so far, and I apologize for that. This is, this is why I'm here, because design is, des is design is designed to break through that clutter. When I said earlier that millennials don't like being marketed to, they don't like being spoken to, they don't like being talked to, but they are emotional beings. They have a reptilian forebrain just like the rest of us. They haven't evolved past us. They've just developed an armor against the typical ways that we like to market to folks. Design cuts through that. It creates an emotional reaction. It's, it's a reach out from the designer to the audience that evokes an emotional reaction. We're showing, I would even say, an expression of love. When I open a box from Apple, I know that somebody loved me. I feel like somebody was thinking about me having this experience. It's like a Japanese tea ceremony to open an iPhone package. 
And that's a purposeful extension of how somebody felt about me as the consumer or the user of that product. There isn't a surface on this vehicle that wasn't considered. There isn't any intersection between any two surfaces that wasn't designed to be so. And because it was designed to be so, that tells me something about the people that developed it. They left nothing to chance. There isn't an accident on this thing. That's the emotional side. The business side for design is also there, the business case. I don't know of a better uh, arbiter or more credible source for information of this sort than McKinsey. Uh, they're not typically known as a firm that, that promotes design, but just recently, within the last couple of months, they published a report that said those firms, and they had a very large sampling of firms, if, if I recall correctly, 100,000 firms with 2 million interactions, 32% more revenue and 56% more total shareholder returns for those firms. This isn't the first study of this sort, by the way. DMI, the Design Management Institute in the States, also did a study of publicly traded companies. They created a design portfolio. And that design port that company of firms that were design-led outperformed the S&P index by 228% over a 10-year period. In the UK, design, Man design council, rather, same thing. 10-year period, different 10-year period, by the way. 200% outperformance. And for those who are, are quant-driven, if you look at that chart, that design-led portfolio index was not down as far as the major index in downtimes. They were up higher in good times. So this is an alpha, not a beta. You're not buying risk, you're actually buying alpha, which is an amazing thing if you think about the ROI. So let's, let's talk about that, let's break it down. What are we doing when we design a custom package, when we develop a custom experience? Well, the first thing that we're doing is increasing the perception of benefits. So if we know our consumer, if we know what they like, if they, we know what they value, in the case of spirits, perhaps it's badging value, membership, entree to a lifestyle, or it lets me be somebody that I'd like to be. I value that. That gives you more pricing control as a marketer. On the other side of the coin, well-designed packaging, packaging that's designed for manufacturing as opposed to designed for illustration boards, can actually lower total cost. Not just the unit cost, but the actual cost of that package as it lives its life and makes its way through the supply chain. And finally, building that experience, that's what gets me the repeat buy, that's what gets me the membership, that's what gets me folks that are loyal to my brand. They want to be part of that experience. That's what Apple has done by creating those memorable unboxing experiences. Put another way, this I think is the last graph in the presentation, if I put perceived benefits on one axis, price on another axis, what I'm doing is defining a relationship between the two. Mature categories tend to have an upward sloping curve. To the extent that I deliver greater benefits, I expect a higher return in the form of a price. And by the way, in that same category, if I'm a potential entrant, I need to understand what the implied, it's what we call a value equivalency line. I need to understand what that line is. I need to understand first what folks value, how they assign value to it, what the rest of my category represents to them, and then make sure I come in above that line because to the extent that I do, I'm giving people more than what they paid for. And they know that. And by uh, conversely, if I try to offer them something that does not have the perceived benefits or the perceived value for the price relationship, they feel like they're getting ripped off and it won't happen. So all that said, what is the result? What kind of results can I expect from a custom development exercise? Well, according to Nielsen, and this is specific to packaging development, this is not a general overall statement about consumer packaged goods, a seven to 21 times ROI. So that's inclusive of design fees, that's inclusive of tooling, that's inclusive of rollout costs, POP, everything you need to do to launch a turtle. 34% average visibility left, so lift. So within the first four seconds, it's noticed more frequently than 
the, those packages that are in the category that folks are used to. A 28% average increase in preference and a net 5.5% increase in sales. So the larger the brand, and this is again across a range of brands, a range of sizes of firms, 5.5% is a non-trivial increase, obviously. So I, I started with this bemoaning the state of, of, of the young jaded designer 20 something years ago. I'm not here to talk about how bad design is, how bad the state of the design industry is today because it's, it's not, it's the design business model that I think needs a little bit of help. It's the notion of running up a clock and running as fast as you can toward a billable uh, hourly rate without any consequence for the commercial solution. This is, this is really what the agency technically is driven by. More, of course, we want creativity, but the more options we provide, the more permutations on those options we provide, the more time we spend, the more money we make. The marketer, the brand owner, excuse me, the supplier, they want throughput. They want to turn a machine on in the morning and let it run three shifts a day, uninterrupted for as long as possible. Reduce the cycle time, make as many parts as possible, as efficiently as possible, reducing the cost of each, lower cycle times, equal more money. The marketer wants a combination of both. So we want to be creative, but we need to be quick. We need to be, uh, we need a, an optimized set of options rather than every option under the sun. And less time is more money. The faster we're in the market together, the faster we can be making money together because in a perfect world where the interests of the parties are aligned, nobody makes any money until or unless the package is on the shelf, the brand is doing well, and it's being bought and rebought. That is the model that we advocate for. Most of what we do is done at no out-of-pocket cost to the brand owner. So we don't invest in every brand that would like our services. We're actually very selective about the folks that we work with and the way that we work. But because we have an interest in the outcome, because we don't intend to charge an hourly rate for the work that we're doing, we may at some points just part ways, and that's okay. And for other customers, we may not even start the project at all, but for those that we do, when we're in the boat, we're rowing in the same direction, and we're rowing as harder, harder than our client because we're a co-investor in the project. That is the sort of the Silicon Valley model of taking equity in exchange for services, and it's done fairly well for, for some of those firms. Uh, as we're approaching time, I'll, uh, I'll give you the opportunity if you want more information about us, about our business model. Uh, we have a table full of folks both here in the center, uh, Alan White, if you'd raise your hand, Marco Bergutti uh, from, uh, from our offices here in Europe. They are here to answer any questions you have about Bruni Urban. We also have a table outside. You can also go to uh, berlinpackaging.com to download white papers on the topics that we've talked about and our contact information is in the proceedings. Thanks very much.